I'm Bill Ennis, and I'm going to be talking to you today about coaching adult basketball. And I'll be drawing a comparison for you. You know, when I was a kid, or even when you're working with uh, kids like boys or girls, it doesn't really matter. It's both the same thing. Uh, be it a school for the deaf or Gallaudet University or whatever university you have, I'm here to let you know that coaches really have an easy life because you always have kids who are lining up in droves, who are enthusiastic and wanting to try out, so the coach just has to set up specific times and dates. Uh, here at the university, as I recall in my time, it was uh, usually October 15th, and they'd set up tryouts for a week, and that gave the coach an opportunity to look over what kind of material he had, and he had a nice pool of players from which to select. And usually the criteria would include things like height, speed, uh, skills, basic fundamental skills such as dribbling, ability to play on defense, and so forth. You'd have that all right there for you, and then you were able to go through and begin the team selection process. Then once tryouts were done, you put up the roster. That was always uh, an interesting time, to say the least. And if someone saw that their name was on it, then they knew that they had made the team. If, however, they didn't see their name, that meant that they had been cut and usually caused some heartache. One of the other things about the arena of uh, school sports, basketball, is that the uniform, shoes, socks, and uh, I don't know what girls use, but I know that uh, jock straps for guys were all provided by the university or by the school, so that they would have everything ready for when practice started. And of course, the gym was never a problem because it was already there. All you had to do was set up what times you were going to begin practice. And you know, in basketball, there's no such thing as a labor law. You have to work uh, seven afternoons a week, and a coach can order them to do that as much as they want. Uh, you just have to basically set up the times that you need the gym to do that. Uh, even meals were taken care of by the uh, school settings. Uh, usually it was very good food for the basketball players. In fact, they were given preference over students who weren't players. So there are all these kinds of things associated with basketball in a school setting. Now let me switch uh, gears for a minute and talk about adult coaching. And when I say adults, I'm referring to individuals who have completed their school or finished whatever post-secondary programs they've been in, and when they're done, they're ready to play some ball still. They have available to them some deaf clubs, such as the American Athletic Association for the Deaf or the Southeastern Athletic Association for the Deaf. Sometimes in their own hometowns, they'll have recreation centers that set up teams that they can join, or sometimes church leagues, uh, which is actually perfect for me, the over 40 crowd, so that we can still play. So those are some of the options available to individuals as adults. You may want to know that there's certainly some difference from schools. For example, uh, adults don't have uniforms because of money, so they have to pay for that on their own. Uh, I know that in universities and colleges, the uniforms and shoes have to be the same. Uh, especially in my time, in the 1960s, we also were required to have shoes and uniforms that were all identical. We weren't permitted to be different. Now with adults, everyone follows their own taste. Some have $150 shoes, some have designer shoes, some have some plain ones, and you have a whole host of different shoes to deal with. They're only there to play basketball, so they have to take care of their uniform on their own. Now the gym does create a little bit of a problem because it's difficult sometimes to even get a place to practice. It's difficult alone just trying to get adults to come and try out. Coaches have to practically get on their hands and knees and beg people to come. And when you do, you get a whole host of excuses about how I've got my wife or my kid to get to. You never have saw those kinds of problems in Gallaudet or in the high school level. You always had tons of people to choose from. And uh, it's a much more difficult process to pull together an adult team. And then when you look at what your selection is, you've got people who are old and graying, some fat, some that are real young, people that are basically out of shape. You're also dealing with a huge range of ages and skills. But if uh, you want to have a basketball team, you've got to work with what you've got. Uh, let me come back to this point on the gym. Uh, 
uh, normally what leagues can do sometimes is they'll collect money and then pay out to a place so they can have Saturday games. And now one of the excuses I've heard sometimes is that people say, well, we need some practice. And I always tell them, don't worry about it. Just show up to the game and we'll start talking about what to do there. Uh, I can start teaching and showing you what you need to do and actually do the coaching there. Now, of course, one of the nice things is that usually I'm getting people who've had some experience. And if necessary, someone's on the floor doing something, I can always ask them to come off the floor. And, of course, I always get a lot of flack about how they didn't have much time to play. But I have to sit down and explain to them the, what's going on on the floor and, and what they need to change. So you can actually do the coaching there at the game itself. Maybe curious as to how it is I set up a defense. Uh, I think a good basis is usually to start with a 2-1-2 zone defense. And I'll tell you how I uh, decide to put who where in that 2-1-2 zone defense. And it's pretty much the accepted standard. Uh, in the back court, you set up two guards. Uh, in the lower or front court, you have two forwards. And then in center court, you'll put uh, your center. Now, what my experience has taught me that it's better that to have uh, the guards uh, up front who are fast. And for the forwards, uh, sometimes you'll have a really good player that you really want to use, but they're a little bit slow. So it's usually a safe uh, place to put them if you put them in the position of the forwards in the lower court, uh, mostly because they don't have to negotiate a lot of space. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, if the ball hits them, uh, they're very slow to react, and what you need are people up front who can go fast. Uh, for your center, you want someone who's hopefully 6'6", six, six, or 2", or whatever. Uh, actually, height is not the critical skill for the individual. You want a, someone who's really quick. The reason being that uh, if the ball goes outside the boundary set by the guards and the forward, then you need them to be able to uh, have a real nose for the ball and be able to get it when it goes outside those bounds. So that's one of the defenses we have. Uh, it's hard to find big guys these days uh, among the adult basketball teams. You don't have the big boys, uh, not nearly as many as you have in college, of course. You know, those who can run really fast and are very good at uh, getting one-on-one -on -one to people. Uh, sometimes you're very fortunate if you can find a young guard to play, but usually it's safe to keep it at, at this zone defense I've been describing to you. Uh, now, every now and again, when you set up your 2-1-2, you may find that you have some really strong guards. Uh, and uh, it may be better to set up a 1-3-1, one, one, where you have one uh, person up front in the back court, one in the lower court, and then three in center. My personal favorite is the 1-2-2. Two, two. Now, in the 1-2-2, two, two, you want someone who is 6-2 or taller, and then you'll set up two players at the uh, center and lower court. And you want people in the center who are real intelligent, intelligent about how to play basketball. Uh, and are also very quick. Then you have your person up front who blocks the ball. Uh, that's why you want him to be so tall. And hopefully you'll force the offense's nose guard to shoot the ball off from the center where you have your uh, two individuals set up at center court and lower court, and hopefully they'll be able to ca cut off the passing lane. If uh, nothing else, at least slow the offense down. And to be quite frank with you, the real key to adult games is defense. If you've got a lousy defense, you're not going to win. And I like to win. I don't care how I win. I like to win. I want to be the guy who at the end of the game, even though I don't smoke, I like to be the guy who gets to walk out on the court with his victory cigar. So I like to win. Uh, so the key really is to be able to know how to work with your defense and change it, modify it as you need. Now, Setting up a good offense is nearly impossible without a lot of practice and people who know their positions. So basically what we look for is someone who is uh, good at handling the ball because what happens is the defense will quickly pick up on who's good with that and be on them. So you want someone who can really handle the ball well and someone who can carry the ball, of course, as well. And basically there's a, the best setup for that would be a 3-2 offense where you'd have a center person with two wings on either side and then they can feed uh, to the center person who can then make a basket or have someone who can feed from the front. Uh, you basically just want to have something pretty simple set up there. I really don't spend a lot of time on offense because a great deal of setting up offense depends on what kind of material you have. 
if you don't have things, then sometimes you can't do what you want. Like if you don't have someone who can shoot a three-pointer, and that's a whole different subject. I guess I come from an old school because uh, when you look at Johns Hopkins or Georgetown University, they play real close to the basket and keep things fed up. And today they uh, seem to emphasize more playing more outside of the inner court. And it has been my experience, though, in the last few years of coaching that those three-point baskets can really upset a game. You can perhaps be up by three or four points with, say, one or two minutes to go in the game, and all it takes is for someone to pop two of those into the basket, and the next thing you know, you're behind by two. So if you find someone who can do a three-point basket, that's great, but it's never been a particular emphasis of mine. Basically what I like are people who can feed to each other and stay inside the inner court. They need to be able to play real tight. I like a defense that can play tight and feed to each other well. Basically what you'll want is to have someone out by the sideline because if the ball gets trapped inside, then what you can do is shoot it to this person who's waiting outside, and normally they'll have nearly all day to shoot a basket. So I have to admit, though, that coaching is always fun, regardless of the limited time and selection and quality of players. It certainly is always a lot of fun. And that shows that we adults uh, can keep going uh, doing this until you get about 45. And then after that, I recommend you switch over to playing golf uh, because you don't have the endurance you once had. I've had so many people tell me that they can go for 10 minutes, but uh, with golf, they can do that all night. So I thank you for your patience and your attention. And let me encourage you that if you want to go and play basketball, I hope that you'll take any opportunities that become available to you. My name is Sandra McClellan. I'm going to talk about my job experiences. I graduated from Gallaudet in 1979 with a degree in PE. And I sent my resume all over the place. But there were no jobs for PE teachers anywhere. Well, in spite of that, I decided to continue sending my resume out, and finally I got a job at the Florida School for the Deaf. Well, the job was with all these adorable little kids from 6 to 11 year old. Well, this was my first job, and I was going to be supervising the kids, and I had to work on the weekends, and I really hated it, but I decided to put up with it because it was my first job. There were several different kind of activities. We took them swinging and to get ice cream and to different beaches in Florida. I worked there for about a year, but again, because I hated working on weekends, I decided to change jobs. And I moved to the New Jersey School for the Deaf in Trenton. Once again, I was supervising kids and working as a dorm counselor. I was working in a middle school this time, and so I was working with the track team and the basketball team, and, and, all, and I was also the volleyball coach. While I was at the Florida School for the Deaf, the kids used my name sign that I'd had all my life. When I moved to the New Jersey school, however, this, this S sign, name sign that I had also was the same sign that belonged to my boss, and her name was Betty and her last name was Schwartz. So anyway, I couldn't obviously have the same name sign as my boss and the kids started asking me what my first name was. When I told them Ruth, they gave me an R name sign right here on the elbow. I really hated this name sign but I decided to take it. At any rate, when I ran into my best friend from CSUN and she saw my name sign, she said, you grew up with this other name sign your entire life and now you're gonna change it? At any rate, we struggled at that school um, because of racism and a lot of problems that were going on there, and there were a lot of issues that I didn't agree with. And I worked there for about two years, but I finally decided to leave. And then I moved to New York State and started working in the Fanwood School for the Deaf. I liked working there, and when I went there, the kids started calling me Sandy again. But when they saw my name sign, they thought that it meant that I used drugs, that I was a pothead or something. And I told them no, that it was, it was a name sign that I had been given a long time ago and I'd used it all my life. They said, you're lying, I don't believe you. Anyway, my boss felt that the name sign wasn't appropriate, so she called a meeting of the entire staff and we were all sitting in the room. 
And we went around the room and tried to decide a new name sign for me because they said that this name sign wasn't appropriate because it looked too much like drugs. Well, the first name sign they wanted to give me was an S off of my nose because I'm really funny. But I didn't like that one because it was silly. And also, I didn't feel comfortable with it. So then they gave me another name sign, an S on the side of my face because I kind of smile a lot. Well, then when I went back, to, I, le I decided to leave the school at Fanwood and went to the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. And I worked there for about five years. That was a good experience for me. I worked as an elementary school PE teacher, but after a while, the elementary school closed down, and we merged with the school that went up to eighth grade. And at that school, they used the same name sign, the S on the side of my face, and I kind of liked that, so I took it. When I came back here to Gallaudet, I did adopt my old name sign back, the S on my elbow again, because I felt more comfortable and felt it was okay for adults to use that. So now when I run into kids around Gallaudet that knew me from all the different schools, I can tell where they met me because they all know me by these different name signs. I worked at four different schools, the one in Florida, the one in New Jersey, the Fanwood School, and also at the Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. Well, now I'm here at Gallaudet, and I'm a PE teacher for the prep school. The prep school is for kids who are still kind of nervous and not really comfortable with, with college life. They're really kind of braggarts and show off, and they walk around with hickeys and things on their neck. And so I have to kind of help them through the health classes and let them know that those kind of things aren't really appropriate. It's also a good job for me because I get to see the kids grow up, and I like that. It's been great for me working at the four different deaf schools, but my most enjoyable experience has been working with the college kids because of the interaction that I have. Often um, with the younger kids, I had to feed them and baby them and just kind of take care of them too much. Now with the college students, if I tell them something, if they don't like it, I can just give them an F if they argue with me and don't do the appropriate thing. So I don't have to worry about it. That's about all about my experiences. My name is Lee Ivey, and I'm from North Carolina. I'm going to be talking about potpourri. The dictionary defines potpourri as being from the French, and it's a mixture of dried flowers with perfume or spices. Today we still use the term potpourri to mean dried flowers mixed with spices and perfume. And now I'm going to talk about how this has become one of my favorite hobbies. And I've been involved in this for about three years. Best time to collect flowers is in the spring and summer.